Hello, my name's Melissa Rogerson, and together with my colleagues Martin Gibbs and Lucy Sparrow, I've completed a project on hybrid digital board games through Game in Lab. This is a photo from our campus. Womanjaka is the word for welcome in the language of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land where our campus is based. So Womanjaka and Bienvenue. In our discipline of human-computer interaction, we're interested to learn more about how people and technologies interact. In the case of this project, and in fact of my research, uh, the technology that we're interested in is board games. And in our subgroup, we're broadly interested in different forms of play. So we have about 12 researchers who are interested in this space in very different ways. This study was motivated by some of my doctoral research where I identified four reasons why people like to play board games. They like the sociality, the social interaction. They like the intellectual challenge of having something to think about. They like the materiality of the pieces and they like the variety of having a choice, a wide choice of games. And we asked ourselves if those are the things people like, what is it that they like about hybrid board games? And is there a better way to talk about them than just saying board games with apps? We had three research questions. We wanted to know what people think about these kinds of games, what functions the digital tools play in those games, and then also how we can meaningfully combine those digital functions within a game. I've turned my camera off so you can see uh, a bit more detail on this slide, but I want to start with a definition that we actually developed quite late in the project. We found it's really important to be very clear about what we mean when we say hybrid digital board game. Uh, and what we mean is a board game where play is enacted through both physical components, physical pieces, and a smart digital element, so a phone or a website. Um, but you need both of those things to play. Neither of them is enough on its own, and neither of them is optional or aftermarket. What we came to understand from this is that it's not a matter of adding a digital component into a physical game. Hybrid digital board games are actually a new kind of artifact that combines digital and physical play. We used four different methods for our study, which I'll talk about in detail, but very quickly, we ran an online survey to understand people's attitudes and experiences of hybrid digital board games. We interviewed 18 board game designers and publishers. We ran some critical play sessions, not just because we wanted to play the games ourselves, but to put them in the context of our own experience of gaming. And we also ran a card sort study to test the categories that we came up with. Our first activity was the survey, which we ran in late 2019. We asked people to respond to a set of questions and tell us how much they agreed or disagreed with different statements that had been made about hybrid board games. We also gave them space to respond in a free text field to tell us about the games that they'd played or their experience of playing them. We had 237 valid responses to the survey from 20 different countries. You can see some different breakdowns here on the slide, and I'll just point out a couple of them. Um, I was disappointed that we didn't get more women to participate. Only about a quarter of our participants were women. Um, and broadly, most of our respondents were hobbyist board gamers. You can see here, they play a lot. I wish I got to play this often. Um, more, than, more than half of our participants play at least once a week. So they're quite experienced, quite active in playing games. So this slide shows the results of those statements that we asked people to agree or disagree with on a scale of one to seven, where one is strongly disagree, seven is strongly agree. So you can see that they're quite, quite confident in agreeing that the physical pieces of a hybrid board game are important to them. And they tend to agree that the experience of playing hybrid board games is social. Um, then we sort of move past that midpoint and we see, for example, that they don't 
quite know what to think about whether hybrid technologies are something that they want to see more of. Um, you know, hybrid board technologies make board games more fun to play, get rid of the boring parts of gameplay. They're really in that space of neither agree nor disagree for that. And at the same time, they're there for these practical concerns that get a lot of airtime, I think, about hybrid board games becoming obsolete or just being a fad. They also tended to disagree quite a lot with what we've called the definitional concerns. So concerns that hybrid board games aren't real board games. They're, they're not agreeing with that. They're not passionate either way, but they're certainly not, uh, not supporting that view. When we look at the breakdown of results though, we see that even though people were perhaps more likely to agree or at least not to disagree with those practical concerns about games, um, there were certainly people who were up in the sixes and sevens, so strongly agreeing with those definitional concerns that hybrid board games aren't real games. And some lovely comments here. I like the stress of the timer and the music, the immediate and grateful feedback when I successfully enter a code, the capacity to provide different levels of help. They're talking about unlock games there. And some other quotes here about uh, different games that came up in the, uh, in the study. Now we also ran, as I said, 18 interviews with game designers and other people working in the game industry. So these are some of the key themes that came out of the interviews that we did with game industry professionals. And they talked about the difference between designing for digital games and board games, um, perceived gatekeeping behaviours about what is or isn't a game, um, changes in the social interactions, particularly when people share their devices. I played an unlock game with some of my students and realised after we'd started that they were very, very uncomfortable touching their teacher's phone. Um, so sharing devices becomes kind of a social issue. And at the same time, you know, we get text messages, we get social media alerts, we get emails on our phones and they can interrupt the gameplay. Designers in particular talked about using digital tools to teach games. Um, this was late 2019 and Asmodee had just launched the Alexa skill for Ticket to Ride. So people were talking about this and thinking about what that might mean for learning games. There were some interesting perspectives on this question of gimmicks and fads. So where, where some of the players were very negative and said, oh, I don't like digital tools, they're just a gimmick or they're just a fad. Some of the designers said, well, maybe they're the gimmick or the fad that inspires somebody else to try our game, um, to try a new style of game. And if that happens, then that's really valuable. And there were also very real concerns about the economic costs of um, not just developing apps, but providing support for them 24 hours a day because the games are being played all over the world um, and also maintaining them through operating system updates. So broadly, we sort of have some very simple summaries here into possibilities and concerns. And I think you can have a look through those lists. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail because I want to talk about the model we've developed. So as I said, we, we have really been working on developing a model where we look at all the different functions that digital tools play in hybrid digital board games and try to classify them and build kind of a, a language for describing what these games do and what they do with those digital tools. So to develop the model, we combined the survey data, some of the information from the interviews and our observations from our critical play sessions to identify 41 different functions that digital tools play in hybrid board games. And we grouped those into different categories, different clusters. We shared that at some conferences to see what people think and take on feedback. And we ran what's called a card sort activity to test whether other people would sort those functions the same way that we did. We identified eight different domains or groups of functions, 
timing, randomising, housekeeping, informing, storytelling, remembering, calculating and teaching. I'm going to go through each of those quite quickly, but Misha has a copy of the full paper, which we'll be presenting at the CHI conference in May. That's actually the top conference in our discipline, and they only accept about a quarter of the papers that are submitted. So we're very excited to be presenting this work there. This is the timing domain. Surprisingly, um, it's about managing game time. So counting down until a particular event occurs, timing rounds, tracking overall game time and duration, initiating in-game events, and sequencing the game, so coordinating what needs to happen at what point of the game. The second domain is randomising, rolling dice, shuffling and ordering components, generating or selecting random events. One of our survey respondents commented that they really like how Mansions of Madness randomises different elements so that the game always feels fresh. The third domain is housekeeping. So this is about choosing and tracking components and configurations, including excluding particular items and objects, tracking in-game resources, generating or selecting boards and configurations, controlling AI players or NPCs, knowing the player's location on the board and within the game, um, showing or obscuring parts of the board or components, so we sometimes talk about fog of war effects, and updating the game as well, so reusing components to create new stories or new scenarios. One of our respondents said they felt First Martians did a particularly good job of keeping track of bookkeeping details. We called the fourth domain informing, although we could have called it communicating as well. Um, so this includes things like telling players about a situation or setting, knowing secret information that the players don't know yet, um, preventing them from accessing particular information until they've done something or achieved a particular condition, and communicating with and between players. And we see particular scope with this last one in the area of post-COVID interactions. So where perhaps people are not co-located, how can we send information to individual people who are socially distancing? Our fifth domain is storytelling. So this covers kind of playing background events, sensing what the players are doing, playing scripted events, Customising playing pieces or characters, we know that's something people love to do with their physical board games, um, and also visualising in-game spaces or elements. Domain six is really about remembering, so recording what has happened already, um, registering the players into the game, remembering their progress or their actions or choices that they've made within a session and also from session to session. Producing shareable artefacts was interesting. We found one game which actually videos players' responses to a particular event uh, so that they can then share that later. Comparing scores or results with other groups, taking notes as a group, and also unlocking achievements or progress, or even just allowing players' skills to improve over uh, several sessions as they progress in the game. The seventh domain is calculating, um, both the simple sort of mathematical arithmetic calculation of calculating scores and costs, but also resolving outcomes, what happens when two objects are combined. This is a real staple, I think, of the unlock games. I can think of one where you have an ultraviolet light and a dinosaur bone and you combine the two. Um, there's also judging. So using the the digital skill of precise and exact measurement to actually see who did something first or who did something most accurately. Using statistics to see which particular cards and pieces or actions are better. Designers are particularly interested in this as well as part of their playtesting. Um, and also determining whether the players have actually completed a task or not. The last domain was teaching. There was a lot of interest in this domain, particularly from people who are in the industry. 
digital tools already need to know the rules of a game, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, but they can also be used to provide setup information and to explain the rules of a game. We know that people struggle to read rule books. We know that they often turn to online videos to help them to learn how to play. Digital tools can also be used to answer specific rules questions, reducing the need for people to go flicking through a lengthy rule book. And they can also be used to give the players prompts or hints. For example, the Unlock games do this very well. There was also discussion of how digital tools might be used to provide tutorials like we see in digital games. Now, I haven't really talked much about how we can combine these functions in hybrid digital board games, but something that we've been exploring is whether we can use the model as a way of representing what combination of elements is found in particular games. We've mocked that up here for four popular games. I'll stress this isn't very scientific. We kind of said, well, there's a lot, there's a bit, or there's very little. Um, but we wanted to represent how each of those domains is used in the game. We'd like to explore this in further research, and in particular, we'd like to see whether players and designers have the same view of the same game. There are so many other projects that we'd like to do in this space as well. I have a small grant from my university this year to look at developing a game that, that we could play right now over a video call, but each of us having pieces, having a board, having meaningful components at each end of that call. We're also really interested to look at accessibility, whether some of these digital tools in hybrid games actually make it easier to learn games and easier for people with a disability to play them. And I have a small passion project where I want to look at wear and tear on games. And instead of seeing that as damage, see it actually as a sign of that game being loved and cherished and played. Thank you so much for listening today. I'm happy to take any questions. And of course, my contact details are here at the bottom of the screen. You're very welcome to drop me an email or send me a message on Twitter. Thank you so much.